So has uh, Russell really proved that matter exists? Certainly not. Um, but he hasn't pretended to prove it. Uh, if we look back a uh, moment at uh, chapter 2, The Existence of Matter, he says, We may therefore admit, though with a slight doubt derived from dreams, that the external world does really exist and is not wholly dependent for its existence upon our continuing to perceive it. But he continues, the argument which has led us to this conclusion is doubtless less strong than we could wish. That is, he admits that, and really it's inevitable, frankly, I would say philosophically, that once we make the distinction between appearance and reality, and uh, appearances in this context at least, are sense data, the way that things are given to us in experience, the, 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 the looks, the sounds, the smells, the tastes, the feels, all of the phenomenal appearances. Uh, in fact, that's what the word phenomenon means, uh, appearance. So all, all these things, once we, once we make a distinction between those things, which are part of our private experience, and the way the world is in itself, the world of physical objects, the external world, or matter. And we say that we can only know the latter, the external world, through the former, the phenomena, the appearances, the sense data. Then we've dug ourselves a kind of a hole in terms of proving that the objects that we normally take to be real, that we encounter in the world, uh, are such. I mean, that is, we can't prove it because we our experience, at least of nature, of the physical world, is, is always um, by way of, we, we say, the sense data, the appearances. And so whenever, wherever we look, uh, we find appearances. We, we never have a direct experience of the thing in itself. Uh, as Russell says, when he looks at the table, uh, what does he really see? He sees colors, various kinds, uh, he uses his other senses. And these are all sense data, and the table itself is a logical inference. That is an inference made on the basis of those sense data. Uh, it's not something that is directly experienced, and therefore there is always the possibility that it, it either doesn't exist or that we're totally misreading our relationship with that physical object. This is, you know, the argument which has led us to this conclusion is doubtless less strong than we could wish, but it is typical of many philosophical arguments. That is, what philosophical argument, especially about a metaphysical question that is so deep, um, about the, the reality of the external world, what, what, what philosophical argument could be sort of a knockdown, drag out, absolute, certain argument? Um, it's typical of many philosophical arguments that it is therefore worthwhile to consider briefly its general character and validity. All knowledge, we find, must be built up upon our instinctive beliefs, or our primitive beliefs, our basic assumptions about the nature of reality that we find that we just have. Upon reflection, we find that we have them. We don't have a deeper level upon which they are based. They are, that's why they're called primitive, or basic, or first principles, or even instinctive in this, in this context. But among our instinctive beliefs, some are much stronger than others, while many have, by habit and association, become entangled with other beliefs not really instinctive, but falsely supposed to be part of what is believed instinctively. Philosophy should show us the hierarchy of our instinctive beliefs, etc. That is, when it comes to this basic level, we might say the metaphysical level, which is our assumptions about the basic nature of reality, philosophy can't establish things, but it can throw light on beliefs that can bring them to light and it can bring their relationship to each other to light and it can ask whether those instinctive beliefs cohere, whether they harmonize with each other or whether there are clashes that between them that force us perhaps to rethink the whole thing uh, or to um, abandon some of the beliefs which may not be as basic as they first appeared. So has Russell really established the existence of the external world? Certainly not. What he's tried to argue is that the hypothesis which, which, which harmonizes with 
our instinctive belief, what other philosophers call animal faith in the reality of the external world, that the hypothesis is well grounded, that it is rational to hold it, that um, although it cannot be established absolutely, it uh, seems to account for things better than other hypotheses. That is, the notion that there is a real physical world that causes our uh, sense data, that is, the cause of our sensations as well. But that hypothesis, which is a metaphysical hypothesis, which we might call realism, uh, that it accounts for our experience, it explains our experience, it makes more sense than other hypotheses, and the one that he's going to examine, the other alternative that he's already mentioned, is, is idealism, which, is, uh, which he identifies most strongly with the philosopher Barclay. So now we move on to the, the, the third chapter, the nature of matter, and the idea is having established to some degree that matter exists. The idea is, well, if it exists, we should be able to say something about it. And, and I'll, the next lecture will be about chapter three. But the first thing that I'd like to say, and I think the, the thing that might, you might keep in mind, because it is a difficult chapter, uh, as you struggle with it, is, uh, at least in my opinion, it is grossly misleading. The title doesn't really pay off. That is, Russell never tells you in this chapter what the nature of matter is. He, he says some very, uh, some very interesting things about how far, to what degree we can know matter, but he says almost nothing about its nature.